hello, hello. Just going to give people a couple minutes to get signed on. Hi, hi, hi. Let me see. There's Jen. Going to promote Jen to panelists. And let's And Jen, I think you are just getting set up here. There she is. Are you muted? Oh, you're muted. I'm here. Hi. Hey, can you hear me? Let's see. I'm just going to send this over to you. Facebook. <coughs> Try resource project. Next. Yay, Chen hears us. Good. I'm just going over on Facebook. Chug <laughs> Let's see. We've got a couple people. All right. Here. We are live on Facebook. Okay. Um, all right. So let's get going. <laughs> <laughs> It's his season again for makeover debriefs and planning for the next year. Um, so the screen, uh, for those of you who are already joining us, is going to go back and forth between Kirsten and me. My name is Jen. I'm the executive director for the RRP. And Kirsten's on here. She's um, basically the guru of the makeover and is who you guys usually deal with um, throughout the year for the makeover. And so we just wanted to do webinar tonight to go over the changes and updates and the rules, clar clarify anything that seems like people might have questions about. Um, we're definitely open to questions. We're going to go through three different sections and we'll answer questions at the end of each section. Um, and basically this webinar is for people who have a basic understanding of the thoroughbred makeover, what the comp competition is, what the structure and basic format is. Um, but for anyone who is unclear of anything we go over in the makeover or still um, is trying to get their arms around it, is new to be interested in me, I'm happy to talk with you about it. So um, feel free to reach out to us via email or via phone anytime and we'd be happy to chat about it. Um, I think the biggest thing we're going to get into first, and forgive me for looking down at my notes, I just want to make sure we hit everything, um, is the rules. We've got a pretty involved rule book, as most of you know, and we try to put everything that's new and changes in red, but then Kirsten did a great job of adding a bunch of clarifications on topics and subjects where people had a lot of questions throughout the year, so we try to make things a little bit clearer there. Um, the biggest thing for this year is there's no fee changes, so that's exciting. Um, we we really appreciate how much people put into bringing a horse along for this competition, just bringing a thoroughbred along in general uh, from the racetrack to the four horse world. And so we have really tried hard to keep our fees as affordable as possible. And we really try to respect as much time and money that you guys put into these horses outside of what you do with us. Um, we're proud that we're one of the most affordable ways to show at the Kentucky Horse Park which is an internationally acclaimed competition venue. So 
Um, we tried very hard to keep all of our pricing in line with what it was last year. We had a ski hike last year and we really want to try to do, do things as affordably as we can while still giving you guys the opportunity to show it a venue like the Kentucky Sports Park. Um, this year, one of the key clarifications as it regards to divisions is the, in the team division this year, um, horses cannot be cross-entered between a standard entry, which is an individual person, and a team entry. Um, we also made the rule that people cannot be involved with more than three horses. Um, so that could be someone who's involved with three different teams. It can be someone who has two standard entries and one team entry. It could be someone who has a standard entry, a team entry, and then catch rides for someone who through unfortunate circumstances isn't able to ride their own horse. But due to scheduling issues and just how much we have going on during the week, we have to limit it to people only riding up to three horses or being involved with up to three horses. Um, we also, wanted to clarify that all teams need to register as teams with a minimum of three participants, including their captain, but then they can make changes to their members or add members up until September 15th. And so this is great for like um, a show barn scenario or a collegiate scenario where you might have more students coming in throughout the year who want to participate in the team or lesson students or people that you show with. And so you can keep adding them to the team uh, up until September 15th. Uh, let's see, horse el eligibility. Do you want to cover that one, Kirsten? Yeah, um, we just added one clarification here because something that we get a lot of questions on um, is in regards to whether or not horses can hunt, um, as in fox hunting. Um, you know, obviously we put some eligibility requirements in place. We limited the number of rides and activities that a horse could do um, before formally restarting the training. Um, and one of the rules that we've always had is that horses can't compete um, prior to December 1st of, you know, the competition starting. So, you know, for this year, this yesterday. Um, and, you know, as far as fox hunters go, you know, there really isn't a competition, but the thing that you're working towards is to take your horse um, to a hunt meet. And wow, my hair is like, <laughs> um, so, <laughs> um, so, you know, that's the, that's the thing that you're working towards. So, um, you know, it's definitely a gray area and we wanted to provide some clarification. Um, so the thing is, is that there is a, um, a, a section of our entry population at, that are steeplechasers and the steeplechasers from what we were able to find in researching this are very dependent on fox hunting um, as part of their training regime. So um, horses can fox hunt during their active steeplechase training um, in first or second fields. What we've asked to limit uh, this year is the rides that occur post-retirement you know, rides that are going to fall in that 15 ride window. Um, if you are going to hunt, you need to limit it to hilltopping or third field, um, keeping it really low key. I realize um, for a lot of fox hunters, um, you know, getting out and, and going autumn hunting or going hilltopping um, is going to be a very essential uh, a value to ride. So we want it to be uh, sensitive to that, but also limiting the amount of experience a horse can rack up in that. Um, that specific time period. So that's um, a clarification that we added in the eligibility section. All right, on to Thoroughbred Makeover Champion in our awards. This was probably one of the biggest changes and one of the most thoroughly vetted changes that we made this year. Um, in the past, I'd say three to four years, um, the Thoroughbred Makeover Champion has been chosen via text to vote. And that was kind of in the years where this competition was was putting itself on the map and it was you know the formative years and it served us well for several years um but this year in particular we really felt like that selection process had run its course and we needed to find a different way to select the person who would be deemed uh the the trainer, the rider of the most well-trained horse that was in our competition and get a $10,000 prize. And so 
we asked a lot of our judges and officials, people who've been involved with the makeover for years. We also got a ton of great feedback on our surveys. So thank you to the several hundred people who gave us some really good feedback through surveys, through emails, through any one of a number of ways. And so the plan we came up with going forward is that the the 10 finalists will come back um, after all of the semifinals, just like they have in previous years, but it will be the judges from each division that choose the winner of the Thurberg Makeover, the Thurberg Makeover Champion. So you'll have the judges rank all of the 10 finalists from 10 to 1, basically saying who they think is the best trained for their new discipline, that horse would get the number 10 vote from them and all the way down to uh, the least well trained of the 10. Um, and then we'll add those up and the horse with the highest total number of points will get the makeover champion award. If, um, if there is a tie for that, that will be determined by the People's Choice Award. So the text to vote still exists, but it is now called the People's Choice Award. And so that will go on the same way as it has in the past. Hopefully people um, get out there, encourage their friends and family to watch the competition. Um, a lot of the racing industry has started getting involved with this too. TVG even mentioned it on air this past year that voting was now open. So hopefully it will still be a big part of it. But instead of that determining America's Most Wanted Thoroughbred or Thoroughbred Makeover Champion, the Text to Vote People's Choice Award will be a prize that we have yet to determine because we'll do something that's in line with what the sponsor of that award will want us to do, but they will earn the, um, the prize of getting to make a donation to the equine charity of their choice. Um, we're not sure what the amount will be. It'll definitely be a four figure amount, um, but that person will earn the right to direct a sum of money to a charity that's most meaningful to them. So, a really important award to try to win and can really make a difference for a charity. It can also make a difference for our finalists because that is also how we'll break a tie. If there's a tie in the third red over champion um, results, the person with the highest number in the People's Choice Award, highest number of text votes, um, they will win the overall third red makeover champion. So Hopefully that's a stronger way going forward to decide an award that's so important um, is the Makeover Champion and the People's Choice Award. Um, and then as far as other divisional prizes, you know, we've, we've gotten a really strong following of junior riders, amateur riders, um, and we want to do more for them as well. So we will be pinning the junior and amateur divisions one through 10 as well, instead of doing the single prize for the top place. So that was something that was really important to a lot of people. And we were really thankful to get that feedback um, on the surveys and just in conversations. So we're going to make that happen for this year. Um, then as far as some other miscellaneous makeover policies, um, the wait list was something that came up this year. We there's some divisions that are a lot more popular than others, especially as people's second choice as far as a discipline, dressage being one of those. Hunters is another really good example of that. And so we decided last year to institute a wait list policy because we simply did not have the time and the daylight and the ability to be able to schedule everyone who wanted to ride dressage if we added in all of those second uh, discipline selections. And so we had a wait list this past year. Chris, Kirsten, correct me if I'm wrong. Everyone who wanted to ride ended up riding, correct? There was no one that got shut out. Yeah, we were ultimately able, you know, we were, we offered people if you wanted to move disciplines around and we could accommodate that, that we would do that. So between people opting to make changes and people that were going to scratch, we did ultimately get um, about 50 horses off of the dressage wait list this year. Um, and it's just important because you know, just because of the nature of the competition and, and how the timeline that we're on is, you know, a little bit more of a, a long game <laughs> um, because we have to make the determinations so early on in the year. In August, you know, we've realized a lot of things change. So um, the wait list, you know, we do experience a lot of scratches between when people 
make that commitment to their disciplines and when we schedule ride times and then even between ride times and in the event. Um, and so we didn't want to try to cram all those people in and then have all these scratches and then have a bunch of gaps in our schedule. It's just not fair to the judges and the officials that are working all day to make that happen, to have them sitting around unnecessarily. So um, as far as waitlist goes, everybody that's entering that discipline as their first choice, they're guaranteed in. If it's your second division choice, um, that's where we start the waitlist based on um, order of first entry. So we'll get all the first choice people in and then we'll start at the top with the second choice disciplines. Um, if a waitlist has gone into effect uh, for any of the divisions, um, we will notify people by August 20th. That's uh, shortly after the final entry period closes in August. So that's how that's going to be handled. Yeah, and so thinking about that, and you know, I know there's always a trend, and I am one of the worst when it comes to this, this trend of procrastination when you have to enter anything, not just the makeover. And so this is a good motivator if you're thinking about doing a second discipline and you think that second discipline will be a popular one, make sure you get your entries in as early as you can, and that will ensure that you're higher on that wait list. Um, change for this year that we're excited about is that we are going to do a horse inspection for all of the horses that make it into the finale. And so the top five from each, di each discipline, excuse me, will make it into the finale, which will take place on Saturday. And so on Friday, the top five from each uh, discipline will come back and do a job, kind of uh, similar to an FEI competition. And it's good preparation for that level of competition since a lot of the people who compete in our event hope to someday do something like that, possibly. So all horses will do a job, will be inspected by some of our head officials. Um, and that'll also uh, give us a good baseline of evaluation for how they're coming out of preliminary competition. So if anyone has questions about that, we'll make sure we have more resources available so you know exactly what to expect, just like we did with the arrival exam last year. Um, but it should be pretty straightforward and a lot of fun. Um, Let's see, vaccination records. The arrival exam vaccination records um, will kind of follow the same protocol it did last year. We follow uh, the protocols put in place by the veterinarians in the state of Kentucky and also nationally. So this year, horses must have their EV, EHV1, excuse me, within six months and no less than 14 days prior to the event. That's key. Um, only the only accepted forms of documentation of those vaccinations are the ones listed in our rule book. So especially if you're someone who gives their own vaccinations or does something other than the standard, which is to have your veterinarian give the vaccination, give you uh, the proper documentation for that, you'll want to read the rule book to make sure you can bring the proper documentation. And then unfortunately, if any horse comes to the grounds and goes to the arrival exam and they don't have the proper documentation of their vaccinations to meet the requirements of uh, Kentucky and the horse park and our competition will have to ask them to leave the ground. So make sure that you review that in the rule book. If you, if you have any questions, we're happy to answer them. Um, let's see, we do have some updates to the minimum equipment required uh, for both warm-ups and hacking around the grounds. You wanna talk about that, Kirsten? Yeah, um, this is something that, you know, we've never really had a hard and fast, like, rule or opinion on, um, but it really uh, struck me just riding around on schooling day, and you just, you see a couple of people that are just really don't have enough equipment, <laughs> um, which it's great that you feel comfortable hacking around the horse park um, in tennis shoes and shorts, bareback and a halter. Um, and I'm glad that your horse is that broke to do that, but it's just not really safe or appropriate for that environment. Um, you've got a massive venue with a lot of activity and a lot of horses who um, are still relatively green, and, you know, we just don't want anybody to get into a situation where they get hurt or their horse gets away from them and they hurt somebody else. Um, so we implemented you know, just some really standard basics, which like if you went to any lesson barn, like you would need to wear 
pants or chaps or something to cover your legs so that if you fell on gravel or concrete, you wouldn't get road rash or closed toed shoes and, you know, just not, you know, making sure that you have an actual head stall with reins on your horse when you're out riding. Um, really bareback riding or bridleless riding or anything at Liberty really needs to be reserved for spaces where um, activities are going on for the freestyle division specifically. Um, it's just not really appropriate otherwise. Um, so it's really just a safety decision. All right, so aside from that, the schooling policies and like I said, the arrival exam procedure are pretty much staying the same. Um, but Kirsten's been good about putting some clarifications in there based on some questions we got over the years. So make sure you review that in the rule book. And like I said, the changes are in red, the clarifications are in blue. So if you've done the makeover a few times in the past, it's super easy to skim and it will not take you like four hours to read this entire rule book. Um, and then the competitor code of conduct, we have had this in the rule book gosh, since we started having a rule book, basically. And um, it's just basic horsemanship and sportsmanship. It's nothing super extreme, but it, you know, a lot of us um, are professionals who ride horses in our spare time or professionals who ride horses for our profession. And so the code of conduct is basically what you'd want to follow in your professional and personal life anyway. It's basically the whole do unto others as you'd want done to you more or less. Um, so familiarize yourself with that, but also um, a key thing in there that I think um, some people just get confused about what to do if they see it. You know, if you see something that does violate the rules and you think it needs to be brought to our attention, we can't see everything on Facebook, out at shows, you know, at barns. So it's important if there's something that uh, is a violation of our rules or that's just not in the best interest of someone's horse or fellow competitors, please bring it to our attention. And we do a very thorough job of vetting out any of those um, allegations. And as you can see in the rule book, you can read it more in depth, but we take accusations like that very seriously, but very fairly. Um, and we make sure that, um, that all of every issue are thoroughly vetted out. And I had to deal with a few of those every year and we try to always do it in the most fair way possible. Um, but we also never want to put anyone in an uncomfortable position if they report something to us thinking that there is going to be everywhere. We keep those things in confidence, but we do our due diligence with them. All right. That concludes all of the rule updates and all of the least fun of the stuff. So, did we have any questions, Kirsten? I'm trying to look on. Um, I do not see anything over on the Facebook side. Um, some questions, but things that we already have written into our agenda that will be covered. So um, I think we're okay at this point and we will check back in after work through the next section. Um, so I'm gonna cover uh, things that are specific to disciplines. Um, and then after that, we're gonna go through actually showing you guys the application and um, you know talking you through a little bit more about specifically what we're looking for there. Um, as far as discipline changes go, um, the mission of this event has always been to showcase these horses on the national stage and make sure that they're being, their versatility um, you know, work ethic and everything that is so wonderful about the breed is being shown in the best light, you know, in this national, like, presence or showcase. Um, and so when we make changes to um, discipline, discipline formats, that is always going to be the paramount in our mind. Is this something that's going to be the best for the presentation of the horses? Um, when we make changes to discipline formats, uh, we work pretty extensively um, with uh, people that are either, um, you know, just like subject matter experts, you know, people that are well respected in their res in their respective sports, um, or people that have served the event in some capacity before, whether it be as uh, stewards, course designers, or judges. Um, you know, so we're really looking at people that have an understanding of what it is uh, that we're trying to do and are, are helping inform our decision making. 
Um, usually when we decide to make a change, um, you know, it's not only through our own observation, but it's as a result of the surveys that we do. Um, we sit down and we read all the feedback from the competitors. Um, and so there's some things this year, um, you know, divisions that were, you know, a little rough in spots last year and things that we know that we need to change. Um, so we're going to talk about that um, in this section. Uh, the first thing that you'll notice is that we have clarification on eliminations for every discipline. Um, we never really truly want to eliminate somebody um, as long as they're, you know, safe to get around. Um, so the way that we do things generally is, you know, if you accumulate a number of faults or go off course or something like that, we will still allow people to finish. You've worked all year, you've come this far. Um, so we have our faults and our eliminations set up so that you're getting like a no score for a phase of a test rather than just being excused and told that that's it. Um, so those are outlined in every, every discipline specifically and, and how that works. Um, the other thing is that um, for our Western disciplines being um, uh, barrel racing, uh, ranch work, and competitive trail, um, we didn't have a very good reference guide for equipment. Um, you know, there's a lot of governing bodies in um, Western sports, which is a little bit different than um, English land in that, you know, we have the USCF rule book to reference. Um, so what we actually did is we kind of put together our own proprietary uh, Western equipment guide for those divisions um, and have that written into our rule book now. Um, Western Dressage is governed by USCF, so we'll continue to reference their rule book for, for that um, discipline. Um, all right, so, sorry, I'm, I have a heater under my desk and I'm roasting, so just give me like two seconds. Okay. Um, barrel racing. So what was new last year is that we had a horsemanship pattern, um, and that was subjectively judged uh, so that it wasn't, um, the scoring in that division wasn't based strictly off of time alone. Um, we had to make some adjustments in the middle of the competition um, so that that um, score was appropriately weighted. Um, so the way that we do it is you receive a score and then this, um, there, that score is inverted out of the maximum points available for that division. So um, for example, if you have a horsemanship pattern that's worth 100 points and you get a 70, your score is a 30, okay? So that we're still working with trying to get the lowest possible score, which is how barrel racers operate. Um, what, we take that a step further and we apply a coefficient to that. And so we're gonna take that inverted score and multiply it by 0 0.05. Um, and that's gonna get that down to a number that equates um, more closely to seconds and so that it makes a little bit more sense for the people that are in that division. Um, so we worked pretty extensively uh, with our barrel steward on that and ran a lot of scoring scenarios, um, you know, using our results from this year to see um, how that would impact things. So we arrived at that coefficient of 0.05. Um, let's see, um, competitive trail. The big change here is that we're going over to that being an individual ride. Um, that has been a group competition um, since the start, and we decided to move back to honoring uh, what is more traditional for that sport and having horses on course uh, one at a time. The other thing that is um, big for that division is we are implementing a maximum time. Um, so rather than saying horses have 30 seconds to attempt a specific obstacle or our need to move on after three attempts, um, we're going to have an overall course time. Um, so that's going to be in effect for that. We've also expanded and put in a pretty robust list of potential obstacles that we might encounter. Um, and those are pretty consistent with um, the things that you would see modeled after equine trail sports. Um, we're working closely with people who are um, judges and officials and course designers with equine, equine trail sports. Um, so they're helping us model things there. Um, eventing um, will now only offer beginner novice and novice jump heights. You're going to do the same height on cross country as you do for beginner novice. 
Um, we're doing away with the training level jump height and we're also doing away with the bonus fences on cross country and the options. Um, previously, it was kind of like a pick as you go, like you could jump a beginner novice or a novice at each fence. Um, so we did away with that. It's much more simplified now. And so you're gonna be just picking one jump height and that's what you're gonna jump on. Um, let's see, polo. Um, polo is gonna move outside, <laughs> which uh, I think is gonna be really cool. Um, we're gonna um, hack the polo field in like half or so, um, just to kind of tighten up the space that's being used. Um, and then we have also reworked what was formerly called the polo agility section. Um, so the scoring for that is based off of um, specific um, compulsory movements. So it's gonna be a lot clearer how that score is broken down. Um, let's see, ranch work. Um, ranch is also seeing the overall time limit implemented for the um, ranch trail portions. So again, um, an overall time to complete the course rather than a specific number of attempts at each obstacle or a time limit at each obstacle. Um, so that is in there. And the other change is that we're going to have uh, three minutes instead of two for the sorting that's in the Okay. Um, last thing here is the hunters. And this one was a tough one. We talked to a lot of people about this. Got opinions from several previous years, judges, um, the steward that has served that division for every single year, uh, the course designer that was involved, um, you know, just really talked this through with a lot of people. And this came about um, as part of a suggestion that we saw on multiple competitor surveys this year. Um, so we got to talking about it and we are no longer gonna offer the two foot um, course height for the show hunters. Um, and some of the rationale behind that is, um, again, talking about preparedness and presenting these courses in the best light. Unfortunately, we have some divisions where um, I think some people who may not be quite ready um, go into that division thinking, well, I can get around and do this. And I appreciate that there is a big commitment that people make to get to this event, but the Two Foot Hunters is where we see some of the most um, uh, a scary riding and uh, horses that are really not adequately prepared for the event. Um, we took that conversation a bit further, um, you know, past the anecdotal evidence and really ran some numbers to see how two foot hunters were performing against um, the rest of the division. And we actually have charts that, charts that indicate that um, the two foot hunters are not as competitive as the two six horses. Um, this year, 25% of the horses that were um, in the two foot six division were all in the top 20 of the entire class. So that's a quarter of all of those horses were in the top 20 versus um, the two foot horses were, you know, on placing on the lower end of the division. Um, you know, if you want to get a little bit more technical about it, it's pretty uncommon to actually have oxers on a two-foot course because you can't get the standards close enough together um, to, to get the, the spread right. Um, that was something that information that I got from one of our course designers and course builders. Um, and you know we want to make sure that you know whatever uh, tests we're asking people to do in the jumping divisions is the same. You know so in show jumpers, regardless of what height you jump, you jump the same track. Um, that's part of why we got rid of training and eventing because the specification uh, for training level show jumps actually calls for two combinations, whereas beginner novice and novice only calls for one. So you're not jumping the same test regardless of height. Um, so we're taking that into consideration here. Um, honestly, I don't think that this is really negatively impacting amateurs or juniors. Um, we ran some statistics and amateurs and juniors were actually more likely to enter the 2-6 uh, division than the pros were. Um, and as far as I know, the one rider that we did have to excuse this year um, was a two-foot uh, or a two-foot rider, a professional rider um, that had to be excused for um, unsafe riding. So, um, you know, and as far as this year goes, our top 10, um, almost every single horse jumped 2-6 in the preliminaries. 
Um, half of those were juniors and amateurs. Uh, one of the horses in the top five was a junior jumping three feet. So I don't really think that this is really um, a decision that negatively impacts um, people depending on their status. You know, people, there are a lot of juniors and amateurs out there that are more talented um, than professionals, and uh, we see that all the time in this competition. Um, so, and just one question that we had see, seen come up over the weekend regarding the, the two foot was that uh, somebody believed that if we didn't offer a two foot division that those horses wouldn't be eligible to do uh, baby greens or pre-greens uh, the following year. Um, we looked at a lot of show bills uh, and cannot find any evidence to support that. Um, baby greens and pre greens aren't recognized by USHJA or USCF, so the spec for them can change from show to show. Um, and we looked at a lot of the major um, recognized shows that do offer the unrecognized classes. Um, so, for example, like uh, Hits Called Pepper, Warrington, Keswick, all of those offer baby green classes, um, but none of the eligibility would have been impacted uh, by this change. So, um, there you have it. Um, the, that's all of our changes for this year. And I'm pretty pleased with them. I think they're pretty minimal. Uh, they're the right choice for, um, you know, making sure that the horses are presented well and um, that uh, riders are ready. And um, if anything doesn't work out well, we'll go back to the drawing board. We're known for doing that. We take a lot of feedback. Um, and we've made adjustments before. So we will see how this goes. Um, yeah, I think this is a good example of why that feedback that you guys give on the surveys is so important, or the feedback that you just give us throughout the year with phone calls or emails or conversations when we see you guys, because that is how the decision about eliminating the two foot hunters came about over the last several years. It was because of a lot of feedback. Um, and Kirsten did a tremendous job trying to get as many different professionals and um, points of view weighing in to try to make the decision. It wasn't a decision that was made lightly by any means. There were a lot of people who weighed in on it and really gave us some thoughtful, insightful feedback. Um, and it seemed like we had a, a pretty very it actually solid consensus as to what we should do and that was to make the decision we did but like she said we're always trying to make the competition as good as it possibly can be so if it doesn't work for you guys throughout the year um when we do the survey next year or before please give us your feedback because you know it's the only way we can improve um so just looking back at your questions here before we move on to um, the segment about actually applying, which um, is going to be most relevant for the people that are new this year. Um, one of the questions that I see from Leandra is, are we going to be more selective with people that are um, entering? And the answer is yes. Um, our goal for the last several years has actually been um, quality over quantity, um, and we will continue to look at that. Um, what's tough is that you do, we don't limit people to um, riding in the discipline that they say they have the most background in. Um, you know, we really want people to listen to their horses and let their horses tell them um, what they're most prepared or what they're most talented for. Um, so we don't tell people if you say that you are an eventer that you can't enter and show hunters. And I don't see us changing that. Um, you know, I do think that you have a lot of people that think, you know, you know, we're not quite ready to go galloping around cross country or we're not quite ready for the pace that's required of show jumpers and that's fine. We want those people to have the option of doing something like the hunters instead. Um, so yeah, we will be tightening things up and looking more carefully at applicants. Um, you know, another thing to consider is that, um, you know, I didn't cover earlier about the two foot hunters is um, athletically, a two foot to two six is not a deal breaker for a horse. You know, I think people have to make a decision as far as developmentally um, and physically what they feel is best for their horse. But generally speaking, these horses that have raced and trained um, 
have experienced a lot more stress on their body than slowly cantering around on our course. Um, so, you know, that is our view on that as well. Um, the horses really do jump better over two foot six fences than they do over two foot. Um, and we saw a lot of that this year. Uh, so, um, Emily, uh, I see you have some questions here about, you know, how we arrived at this decision and I'm happy to um, take that up with you, you know, in an email or a phone call. So please feel free to give me a buzz. I'll talk through it a little bit more with you. Um, okay, so um, application stuff. I am going to turn on screen share here. Um, let's see, maybe if I can get it organized. Is this screen, screen view? Okay, can everybody see my Thoroughbred Makeover website? Or I it... can. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like very confused for a second because usually it like lights up and tells me you're sharing the screen. Um, okay, so this is the um, Thoroughbred Makeover website. We do maintain two separate websites because the amount of information that we have to uh, convey when it comes to this specific event is uh, too much to lump in with our other website. So we have tvmakeover.org um, and there are links all over this page uh, for where you can go to apply. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go up here to competitor portal. Um, this is an area that um, a lot of you should be familiar with because um, you're going to spend a lot of time here. Um, to access this section of the website, you do need to be logged in with an active RRP membership. So that is step number one, making sure that your membership is active or that if you're a new member that you, you join up and then you go over and try to access this section of the website. Um, so this is a hub for everything for competitors. Um, you can see all my test entries back here from previous years. Um, you can actually see that I've already entered a team. And um, we have important dates on the side and a lot of linked up information here on the right hand side as well. Um, and, but what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna create a trainer application. Um, so you're gonna arrive to a page that looks somewhat like this. If you are a first time competitor, the very first question that this page is gonna ask you before it even looks like this is how old you are. That is because we have an age uh, minimum of 12. Uh, so it's, if you are either 12 already or going to turn 12 in 2020, um, you will be eligible to compete and then it'll open up the rest of that one for you. Um, before I get too far down into the technicalities of this, um, our application process is our opportunity to determine if you are likely to um, positively and successfully introduce a horse uh, to a second career on the timeline that has been set forth and come and compete safely at the Kentucky Horse Park in October. Um, we realize that this is a timeline and it's not going to make sense for everybody. Um, but when it comes to the type of information and the details that you provide in this application, I cannot stress to you that the more information, the better. Um, because like this is you telling your story of of why you're ready to do this and we can't make decisions on anything more than what is provided to us in this application. Um, let's see. Um, the other question that we have um, is how many people get in? Um, and we have a number that we know we have like is our limit as far as capacity. Um, but as I was mentioning before, our concern is always going to be about um, quality. And so if we have less quality applicants than we have for capacity, that doesn't mean that we're going to just start letting all these other people come in just to fill the show. You know, we really want to be focusing on um, making sure that the people that are accepted into the event are prepared to take on um, this venture. So that is how we look at it. Um, let's see. Um, and, you know, and I don't want to get into too much as far as statistics of like how many people are accepted versus how many people apply and that sort of thing because 
that's a real moving target. And it wouldn't be fair for me to tell you like last year we got X number and only accepted X number because we don't know anything at this point about the quality of applications that we're going to receive. Um, okay. Um, so the first section here is that you're going to pick team or standard entry. Um, I actually already have a team entry. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hit standard. Um, if you're entering as both, like if you're going to captain a team and you're also going to have regular individual entries, you have to complete two applications, one for the team and one for you as an individual. Um, usually we're able to offer saddle pads, so you need to tell us what kind of saddle pad you want um, and if you have come in the past. Um, I'm going to say that I have been before, and all that's going to do, it's going to pre-populate information that's um, on file from previous years, so I can just kind of take a peek and update things rather than starting from scratch. Um, then we get down here to contact information. So all this contact information is pre-populated based on the contact information that you put in when you set up your membership. So it's linked into your account on the website. So you just want to take a quick look here and make sure that everything is accurate. Um, we also utilize a text notification service, so we ask you to opt in or opt out here as well. Um, let me see, I'm just kind of following my, um, my notes here. Um, okay, so now we get into the background section. Um, what we added this year is if you have any memberships with um, national governing bodies, whether that's USCF, AQHA, USEA, like any of those like four letter <laughs> associations where we could take your membership number and look up your competition background, that would be a huge help for us. Um, so if you could include any of those here, that would be great. Um, moving on down, if you have a website or social media page that's available to the public, um, where you're sharing a lot of your riding videos and you know like business pages for um for your farm or if you keep a blog or anything like that you would go ahead and put that here um a reminder like any section that asks for a link um or a website can you please actually give us a url that has like dot com or dot org um just telling me to look you up on instagram is a really good way to get your application shoved down to the bottom of the pile while I go through everybody else that's given us everything that they asked for. Um, so again, just making sure that you're providing complete links, um, that they're functional links, that um, if applicable, they're set for um, public viewing, so that I don't have to be your friend to look at your Facebook pages with that means. Um, Let's see. Moving on here, um, your status, whether a professional, amateur, or junior. Um, we follow the USCF definitions for these, um, so you can link here if you need to reference any of those. Um, your disciplines. This is not the discipline that you are going to enter um, in October. We realize a lot of you will. You know, I say I'm an inventor, I'm going to enter in the eventing division. Like, but what we want to know is where your area of experience is. This doesn't lock you into competing in that same division come October. Um, so you can put at least one primary. If you have background in the secondary, you can do that. Um, if you participated in past events, it should populate that list correctly for you, but go ahead and add on um, if you have any other years that we need to um, add. Um, Let's see. Competition highlights. Um, so this is just going to be, you know, I started competing when I was 12. I have gone, you know, I've competed through third level dressage or I have my bronze medal or, you know, any of those types of accolades or recent um, results are really helpful, um, particularly include um, the name of the horror show, um, what division you were in, what your result was, the date of that result. Um, again, like we need to look and verify these things. Um, let's see. Um, this describe your skills and experience. This is just an added area for you to give us a narrative on anything else that's relevant to your experience training courses. Um, so 
and then there's the video section. So between these three key, like these are the three biggest sections that we have to look at when it comes to determining your ability level. So be generous with the information here. Um, because you know you may be a very accomplished and able horseman but you don't have a lot of competition history this is where describing your background and giving us some videos is going to really aid us in making that decision um, when we talk about videos um, a couple of things are really helpful for us um, when it comes to looking at videos um, please don't make them too long um, just don't send us a 12 minute video it, it's just really, it's a lot. Um, what we're looking for is for that video to demonstrate the skills that you say that you have based on your discipline of experience and that you could complete the test that's being asked of you in competition. So for eventers, that's gonna be, can you jump around a beginner novice type course at minimum? For hunters, can you jump around a two foot six course? Same for the jumpers. Um, you know, can you do a training level dressage test? Can you work cattle? Can you do your stick and ball? Like, you know, any of those skills that are unique to discipline should really be demonstrated in this video. Um, we need that video to be clear. Um, please don't um, video yourself on a, with your mom holding your cell phone from on the other side of the back 40. Like, we really, we can't do anything with that. Um, we don't, um, Picture clauses are cute, but they don't actually tell us anything about your riding abilities, so they're not helpful either. Um, let's see. Anything else that I wanted to say about videos? Yeah. Um, that's, that's my spiel about videos, um, after having watched a lot of them over the last couple of years. Um, moving on to the references section and the affiliations um your references this could be any person that is um that can vouch for your abilities as a trainer as a horseman um if you're a first year trainer you absolutely have to provide at least one uh, with complete contact information um affiliations would be um if you have a relationship with an organization that does similar work to us. So this could be like, I volunteer for Cantor, or I volunteer for Mid-Atlantic Horse Rescue, or um, I'm a member of my college's um, club riding team, like any of those sorts of things are helpful for us as well. Um, the vet letter. Um, this is required every year, at, um, whether you are a new or returning trainer. Um, that letter needs to be dated within 60 days of January 15th, and it needs to be on file by January 15th. Um, what that letter is, is something on practice letterhead from the veterinarian that you work with saying that um, your account is in good standing and that they believe that you have the ability and resources to properly care for a thoroughbred for a year. Uh, that's all we're looking for, um, and that's a pretty typical thing, um, particularly for adoption organizations. They, they ask for those references and keep them on file. Um, if your vet has any questions about what, you're, what we're looking for, we're happy to answer any questions, so feel free to put them in touch. Um, so you can <coughs> excuse me, um, upload it here, or and so the file types are going to be PDF, JPEG, JPG, PNG, and no larger than three megabytes. And if all of that is Greek, which I certainly understand if it is, um, just go ahead and send it to secretary at tbmakeover.org and we'll get that uploaded for you. Okay. Um, numbers of horses and fees. Um, individual entrants can enter two horses, teams can enter one horse. Um, you cannot change the number of horses that you wish to enter after applications close and we don't offer wait lists so you have to make that decision now um, so you're going to go ahead and update everything and say that you have read the rule book which i hope you have um, and then you go ahead and hit submit um, so that is what the trainer application looks like um, and i'm actually just going to go back to the competitor portal rather than submitting a new one um, when you submit it's just going to take you back here anyway, um, and you can hit this button to pay your entry fees, 
Um, if you're a team, you can go here to add team members. Um, again, you have to have three team members on record by the time applications close on the 15th of January. That's required for the teams. Um, and they, all those members have to be, all those team members have to be active RRP members as well. Um, so the way that this works is um, you can search by last name or email here. Uh, go ahead and hit search. And you're going to have a record of who you could possibly add. Um, so here, Jen Crowell, the show secretary, um, I could add her to my team. Um, there's a couple of other people here for last name Crowell who don't have an active membership and I can't add them to my team. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and hit add. And then what happens, you have added Jen Crowell to your team. Um, Jen's actually going to get an email that says, hey, Kirsten asked if you would be on our team, please confirm. And then she has to come back to the competitor portal and confirm that nomination to the team. Um, you know, that's just a precaution to make sure that people aren't putting three dummy people on their team. Um, you know, we hate that we have to do that, but that's just how it is. Um, so that is the competitor portal and how to, how to access the trainer application. Um, and that's actually everything that I have for this section as well. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And look here uh, in questions. Um, Lindy Gutman wants to know if trail has to be done in Western TAC. No, it does not. It can be done in Western or English TAC. Um, it, we do not offer an in-hand option anymore. Um, that's a, um, a bit that I failed to mention uh, when I went through that discipline uh, change section, but there is no longer an in-hand option for the trail division. Um, I'm just going to hop over to Facebook and see if we have any new questions. I don't think that we do. I just looked through and I don't think we have any new questions that we haven't answered. Um, but that being said, we know a lot of people are going to watch this after the fact. Um, so if questions come up that we haven't answered or that have prompted other questions that we didn't think of, definitely feel free to reach out to us. Kirsten, myself, uh, everyone that works at RRP, all of our contact information is on the website and we're always available by email. We're available at reasonable hours by phone. Um, if you live in Maryland or if you live in Kentucky, we're happy to grab a drink or a cup of coffee and talk through stuff then too or see you at a horse show or whatever. So we, definitely, we make these adjustments and we make these refinements to this, not only the organization, but the event because of feedback. And this event is a unique beast. There's no other event like it in the world with 10 different disciplines, several divisions through those disciplines. So, you know, perfection is unattainable. You know, we wish we could hit it out of the park every time, but it's because of you guys helping us kind of find our path sometimes that we do. Um, well, you know, I just have to echo Jen again, like, you know, we spend a lot of time deliberating over these decisions and our door is always open. You know, the changes and the evolution of this event is really spurred by people who are passionate about us, about what we do and about the event and help us make it better and better every year. So um, please, if there's anything that we can help you, don't hesitate to get in touch. And um, with that said, I think we just wrapped up our most efficient RRP webinar, <laughs> clocking in at just under an hour. So thank you all. Hello. Yeah, I just want to say too, you know, like everything that we do is for the thoroughbreds, like what you guys do too. And, you know, we're concluding Cyber Monday today, doing a webinar, how appropriate, but tomorrow's Giving Tuesday. Um, we, obviously being a nonprofit, have a bunch of fun stuff going on on Giving Tuesday. One of my favorite things that we do during the holiday season is the Thankful for My Racehorse campaign. So you can take part in that and use the hashtag thankful for my racehorse and share stories about the racehorses in your life currently or racehorses that have been in your life in the past or horses that have had an impact on you that you've never even met and share that. And the more we get that out there, the more we help 
bring a positive aspect to the thoroughbred industry, on track, off track, all in between. Um, and obviously, Giving Tuesday is important to us, but you guys have so many organizations outside of us that you support as well. So I really encourage you to reach out to the organizations that mean the most to you on Giving Tuesday or throughout the holiday season. You know, if you can support them with a donation, there's nothing too small. There's definitely nothing too large when it comes to donations, but there's nothing that's ever too small. So if you can't make a donation, do something simple like just reach out to them and let them know the difference that they make in someone's lives. A big thing that helps nonprofit organizations are just simple testimonial statements about how they impacted your life or the life of your horse. So on Giving Tuesday, I would so encourage you to make sure that the people who mean the most to you in the nonprofit world know it through any number of ways that you can let them know that. So thank you guys so much for watching us today. And let us know if you have any questions or if we can do anything for you makeover related or in any other way with off track thoroughbreds. Thank you guys. Have a great evening. Bye. Always have to wave to the webcam at the end. Oh.